All right, welcome everyone. Um, this is a um, skim virtual interim session and uh, we are recording. We are also following the IETF procedures. So the note well applies. Um, I think most of you have joined in the past, so you should be familiar with the note well, which is um, basically describing the code of conduct and um, process and procedures for how we conduct our sessions. Um, I wanted to go ahead and get started with the agenda bashing. Oh, my apologies, Aaron. I forgot to add you here. See, this is what I get for doing it last minute. So, first order of business, I want to welcome our co chair for this um, group, and that's Aaron Parecki. So, welcome, Aaron. Don't know if you wanted to say anything. Oh, you're on mute. Too many audio buttons. There we go. There you go. Nice to nice to be here. Thanks um, for having me. Um, so yeah, I'll I'll just uh, give a little background on myself. I'm um, primarily been involved with the OAuth group, so you may know me from from that world. And uh, I work at Okta, doing primarily uh, training education around OAuth and security concepts. So um, this I've been involved with the IETF. Um, OAuth group for quite a while, uh, but probably most actively since I don't know four years or, ago or so. Um, and this will, this is my first role as a chair, so I am new to that side of the process. Well, I'm I'm much appreciative of you um, willing to co-chair with me. So I'm I'm looking forward to um, our engagement here. Thanks. Okay, so. Um, that said, I uh, commandeered Paul to be one of our note takers. Could I have a second and potentially a third one? I've got the link up here. Um, it would be great if we had more than one just so that we can capture it and follow, you know, perhaps later. If you can help me with the, uh, text extraction, you know, I, I can, um. For completing that up too. Sure. Anybody else who could help with the note taking? Matt? Janelle? I'm just not feeling so well today, Nancy, so I'm not putting. Oh, uh, okay. Thank you. Sorry. No, no worries. I'm happy to, to charge in solo, Nancy, if that helps. Okay. I very much appreciate it. Okay. So that said, um, I, um, we need to figure out how, how we can get this group to be more, more vocal <laughs> on the mails and on, on the uh, Slack channel, because I, I did ask for, um, proposals for agenda items. I didn't get any, but the first two um, orders of business that is in our charter is to update the use cases as well as the schemas and protocols. Um, Phil, thank you. You did provide me some feedback for adding something for the IETF uh, 113. And so I've got a proposed set of items um, that we can discuss towards, you know, we'll reserve the last 10 minutes of, of the call to go through through the um, agenda for IETF 113. Um, is there anything else that uh, the group wants to bring up besides the updates on the use cases and the schema and the protocol updates? No, uh, I've got 1 or 2 topics. 
Um, there are things like drafts aren't even written about, just things that I'd like to drum up interest for maybe in uh, solving certain problems uh, with the, the current spec So uh, at, towards the end. Okay. Like how to uh, securely handle pictures would be the big one. How to securely handle what? Uh, photos or pictures. Oh. Okay. See, also at the end of the agenda, if we don't mind talking a little bit about some housekeeping, I created a GitHub repo to collaborate. Oh, yes. Hoping that we can collaborate there. I've shared it with a couple people. Excellent. All right. So, um, since Pam is not here, uh, Danny and, and Janelle, I know you're not feeling well, but uh, can we get an update on how the use cases um, work is progressing? Uh, sure. So, I, I had a call with uh, Pam and uh, one of the other people at Microsoft who's involved with STEM uh, recently, and uh, I, I'm not sure like precisely how much progress since the last draft that Pam shared, at least uh, with like some of the people who are editing, uh, like I, I'm not sure how much we've on. There has been a fairly substantial amount of work on uh, it. Honestly, it, it feels closer, if my memory is correct, to a rewrite of use cases rather than, you know, the sort of processing of errata and, uh, you know, small like clarification fixes. Um, but, uh, there, there's a decent amount of work there. Um, I, I'm not sure how much has happened in the past few weeks specifically. Okay. Uh, Pam has hit a period of, uh, you know, more problems to solve than she has been with to solve them. Uh, but she's working on correcting that so that, uh, she can get us to the point of having a draft ready by, uh, June. Okay. And, and that's totally, well, not totally fine. As long as there's progress being made and perhaps for IETF 113, um you and pam you know the the team that's focused on the use cases can talk about the the current thinking of the use cases that we're going to cover mm -hmm. i think that would be important for us to go through yeah and i have uh one more addition from elliot i he was going to provide some content to share with pam for the device use cases awesome I presume that would be the case because at the last call, I, I, I recall we, we had unanimous agreement that it should be covered. Um, so I would expect that to be in these cases. Thanks, Janelle. Um, do you want to give Elliot a reminder? So it sounds to me that there won't be a, even a rough draft that would get submitted because I think the deadline for the zero zero submissions is next week. And that's just, you know, that's typical procedure for the IETF a week before, uh, actually two weeks before the sessions, they freeze the server typically because they need to, to shift towards the face-to-face -to -face meeting. But then the, um, the portal gets opened up again. Um, so that we can submit while we were at, at ITF. But my point here is, is to ask the question whether there'd be even a rough outline for the UK use cases. Do you know, Danny? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I'd have okay. to check with Pam. Uh, I, I know she, she's presented to us, but I, I don't know that it's in, uh, Sort of, you know, like the, the RFC forum versus, you know, like slides on a PowerPoint or a Word doc or anything like that. Okay. Well, I mean, at this point, you know, it, if it's not ready to be an RFC form, even just having a rough outline presented of, and again, right, not conforming to the RFC if you're not ready, but at least outlining the different use cases um, that we want to cover. Just so we yeah. can have discussions. Yeah, I, I can check with her and get back okay. on the on the mailing list or somewhere. Great, thanks. Okay, um, so that's the, oh, what, comment? What com comment 
it just seems like a good time to add this comment because I haven't written a draft in two or three years. Um, I'd recommend anybody who's going to write a draft or hasn't yet submitted to um, plan to attend the ITF draft writing seminar that they will likely have over the weekend before. It's usually when it's held. Um, I found there were enough changes. It took me two days um, as an old XML draft writer to figure out um, all the changes that have occurred uh, and to debug it all. It's a little bit tedious. It's gotten more powerful, but it's tedious. And I think uh, I'm going to attend um, just to get all the tips and tricks. Um, and that'll save you a lot of time. So if you, if you haven't already committed to publishing, but you're going to, I, I would, that would be a good session. It has been in the past that you just go, oh, that's why it's this way, you know? And um, um, that's Thanks. that's uh, personal experience there. Yeah. Thanks for pointing that out, Phil. And uh, the I need to that in the chat, Phil, I, I would be interested in seeing that. Yeah, I also I had the privilege of having Elliot give me a slight tutorial on the the Markdown files and using cram down. Mm -hmm. And so part of my goals in the last week or two is to try to get a boilerplate just template going. Um, that maybe there, we could share. Um, I thought Martin Thompson. So Phil, I, I don't know if if you got it in the last tutorial, but um, there was some tooling that is made available on GitHub that um, gives you basically the, the make file, if you will, for how to take Markdown all the way to, um, and, and it does also show you um, the steps for installing Cramdown and XML to RFC. Um, yeah, I've, um, I tried that briefly. Yeah. Um, and I found certain things are faster and then certain things are much slower. So I reverted back to uh, XML. But to your point, um, under GitHub, under I think it's the IETF tools account, there's a series of things like XML to RFC. There's a markdown converter. They run actually better, I found, if you download them or, or clone them and then do a make file, as you say. Um, and certain things happen. Like one of the things that um, ITF now supports, instead of text-based diagrams, you can now do SVG diagrams. You can do a web sequence diagram and have it look good. Um, so there's a bunch of tools there as well. Um, I haven't gone to a recent session. That's my plan is to go to the, the next session. So, um, but this is what I figured out over a couple of days, and um, I found the tools in GitHub to be invaluable so and if you're going to go with markdown yeah look to those tools and so forth um well, if the, I remember, the, yeah i yeah. i was just going to say if i remember or if any one of you um see them if you can post them to the slack channel the general skim slack that'll yeah. be useful for everybody yeah, can do I dropped a link in the in this chat, but in under the notes, but I'll put it in Slack as well. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. I've got a folder of bookmarks with all the various uh, bits and pieces. I, I've done the full journey of uh, what do you call it? Markdown or, or cram down into XML into RFC a couple months ago. So uh, re reproducing that might be a little trickier than. Uh... <laughs> well, and, and the tools do keep getting updated as well. Right? Every year, some of the copyright stuff changes. Um, yeah. And just in general, like Ruby caught me by surprise. I think it was last year. Last year. Yeah. It wasn't ITF. It was just the general tools. All right. I'll, I'll spin up a new channel in Slack for discussion of um, writing documents, um, tools, best practices, etc. Great. Sounds like a great channel. Thanks, Paul. Okay, now that we did the little sidetrack, which was useful, mm -hmm. is we do eventually need to get them to be in the ITF template conformant. Okay, so um, 
Let's move on to the schemas and the protocol RFCs, and, and I expect them to be new drafts as well. It's not going to be errata. Um, Danny and Janelle again, updates? Yeah, we, well, Danny and I were discussing new versus drafts, and one of the, we were revisiting the charter, and one of the goals of the charter was actually to take the skim to to an internet draft, which it isn't at today. And so we were thinking of maybe we do need to do a quick pass on the errata and basically get it into shape so that we can all agree and say, yep, that looks like skim 2.0, we'll agree, that's the standard, take it there. Um, and then continue forward on the beyond skim 2.0 work that we've discussed. Okay. Does that sound, does everybody, agree to that in this space? Can we take a vote? <laughs> well, we, we need to start that discussion. Um, I was going to say justification isn't the right word. If you can walk us through um, Janelle for the journey that you're taking right for the path that we'll end up going. I'm trying to, to be more flexible on whatever that path is that you want to design for the group. Um, would go through. Uh, I are, you, are you talking, Janelle, uh, just to clarify, because it, it sounds like what we should do first is get the list of, let's call them bugs for now, and determine whether they're truly errata or whether they're enhancements. Yes. And then decide. Yeah. and right. and. The one of the things that on the side, it's a little later in the agenda is the GitHub repo. I set up one that looks kind of like the other working groups uh, for IETF. I don't know if it's exactly right or not. Um, and, and Danny and I were discussing using GitHub to track all those issues and then carry them forward into, you know, the different buckets that they should be in, Bill. And uh, we yeah. thought we could, could group collaborate that way um, if we all agree that that's the appropriate place to, to track all the, the things. Yeah, yeah, that would work for me. Yeah. Because I can put a bunch in. We okay. did agree, um, I think, at our November session that uh, we would track the issues through the GitHub. Um, and so, Janelle, once we get to the housekeeping, we can talk about how we, we shift um, from a work in progress to an adopted document, but both of them being used, uh, not used, both of them using GitHub um, and again, using the issues to track. Yeah. Yeah, we were thinking of maybe having a folder or a directory in the GitHub that was unsubmitted drafts and another one for submitted drafts, perhaps. Maybe we could add some tooling in there that could just make files, submit it for you or something like that too. If we can well, get submission... kind of the automation of this going. Okay. So it, it's the notion of renaming and moving the repo from the unsubmitted or the unapproved or yet to be approved, whatever we want to call the folder to adopted, right? So we'll have a repo that talks about the adopted draft, not talks about, but um, has the view of all of the adopted drafts in there. Um, and uh, typically in the other working groups that I chair, we've We've had two separate um, GitHubs, and then what they do is they just they they do have to rename the drafts because before they get adopted, it's typically um, draft dash you know somebody's last name dash um, skim dash whatever the um, there's a naming convention is what I'm trying to say. Gotcha. And then once it's adopted, then it becomes a draft dash itf dash skim. And that's effectively the convention that gets used so that people understand what's been adopted and what's not. 
just by looking at the file name. Okay, sounds good. We'll work through that, I'm sure. Yep. Okay. So, um, is the same process then being followed for both the schema and the protocol? I would that's, a, that's our intent, yeah. Okay. And, uh, so at our last intro meeting, uh, I put the idea out there of sort of, you know, do we stick down the path of 2.0? And I, I sort of made it like a, you can only choose one, which maybe that's not actually how we should have approached it. Of uh, do we push to move Skim 2.0 to Internet Draft, or do we just sort of, you know, pivot, turn our focus towards uh, like the, the next iteration of Skim? You know, we'll informally call it Skim 3.0. Um, and I think we sort of we we had a general consensus in the last interim for support of like moving the standard forward. Uh, so I, I had a chance to consult with. Uh, uh, one of my peers at Microsoft, uh, Mark Wall, who's got some experience in the standards world, and his feedback on the idea of uh, like sort of trying to go for Skim 3.0 was uh, essentially if we try to write one big epic, it's uh, you know, it, and include everything that everybody wants into a standard, uh, moving it forward and getting progress could be a lot harder versus uh, sort of put like stopping at 2.0 and just extending it. Uh, further with uh, a, a long list of extensions, and I, I'm not experienced enough. Like I, I, I want this to sort of come up for discussion. I don't know if this is the right channel or if we actually uh, dedicate some time for it in the, the the March plenary to talk about it. We probably should allocate some time at the plenary to discuss. Like, I, I think, um, given the milestones that we have currently, uh, and the, and the charter, it, it makes sense that, um, uh, for now, at least we start by trying to move skim 2.0 from proposed draft to internet draft. Uh, and, you know, whatever that entails, you know, processing of errata, any small clarification changes, et cetera, uh, that. Even if we do later decide to target like the, the big new epic of skim 3.0, uh, that probably serves as a good base of, uh, you know, processing through all of the, the small problems with 2.0, because we do want to. You know, wh whatever we build next, whether it's, you know, 2 dozen extensions to 2.0 or 3.0, uh, we probably want it to be backwards compatible as much as possible for, you know, an easier, uh, like upgrade path of implementation. That is absolutely true. The interoperability and backward compatibility is something. Yeah. We didn't explicitly write that in the charter, but, um. Yeah, yeah, like, I'm, I, I feel like I'm, I'm mostly personally indifferent to, you know, 2000 extensions versus write uh, an entirely new, you know, 3.0 spec. Um, but I. I think for now, at least, you know, the, the more conservative course of action while we figure that out is probably to move 2.0 forward to that final stage. And then we uh, can just build on that if we need to. The current mechanism, just so everybody knows, is, is can be done in the path. So we're supposed to be able to go slash V2 for skim 2, because we had went through this with skim 1 versus skim 2. So if it's v2.1 if there's an incompatibility you would introduce a new path but, and then a server would either default to the latest and if somebody just wants um to still talk skim to you would say slash v2 slash users and so on um so that's the current mechanism it's probably not well implemented Got to start somewhere. <laughs> well, so Phil, the question is well implemented because it's lacking specificity in any documents or? I think because we haven't really had a major change. Like skim one was, was dramatically different. It had a lot of interop problems. Right. So you tended to be either two or one. Now we're talking about a scenario where we could have coexistence for a period of time, whereas one and two really didn't coexist. Got it. 
the PMs in the room may be able to comment, but I, I that's think not been my experience. I think you're right on the two to three that people who adopted two may stay there quite some time before they go to three, depending on what three looks like. So, or maybe they'll I, come I'm to this sure. phone. Because it's hard to get rid of a standard once it's established, right? Well, I'm so it's sure working. It, is it a big shift from a two to a three, or is it like a 2.1? I guess at that point, it doesn't matter. It's a different version. Maybe we vote on that as we see it taking shape. Let me give you an example, which I'm not sure is an errata. Maybe you could comment, Nancy. In the patch command, we had add, replace, and remove for an attribute. And, and when you have a multi, when you have an attribute and somebody says, what if I just said replace? And if the value doesn't exist, it'll just add the value. The spec is unclear on that. And people are wondering, should I throw an error or should I just be cooperative and add the value? Um, and that's the question I get a lot of times and it's unspecified in the spec. Right. So if you add clarification that says, yeah, just go ahead and add the value. For some people, you're making a functional change, but for other people, you're reaffirming what they already decided to do, which is to be generally cooperative with the protocol. Uh, and that's the kind of issue where we have a few corner cases like that, where some people might have been strict, particularly if you came out of the X 500 community where everything must break if it's not exactly on. And then there's the rest community, which says, well, if you understand it, let it go ahead. And um, that's how I sort of answer that question. If you understand it, let it go ahead. And some people that drives them nuts. So, yeah. We, so is that an iterata or is it a. But it's a backwards compatible, I would argue, for the most part. Right. Um, I mean, I, I, I would some... construe it more as an errata in, in that we're making clarifications on the intent, but. Yeah. Well, or do we follow in the steps of Aaron who had, they put a, a best practice doc together for OAuth. Should we have a best, back, best practice doc together for skim? And would that fit in that doc? That's a great example because one of the ones that people keep saying I need cursor based paging is because there's a limit in skim on how many results you can get. But if you're in the spec, it's optional. It's not well, optional for the client. Right. It's optional for the server. Well, that's something that so. we can discuss as a group and get consensus on. I mean, I'm here to help guide the group as is Aaron, right? Um, you're kind of reminding me of the scope and the bounds that we need to put on what's on on the bounds of the functioning capabilities of the protocol and the schema versus the common practice um, to get that level of interoperability. So we had some of these discussions in, for example, in the uh, EAP framework, um, as well as in the radius for doing authentications and specifically for radius, the boundary was more of anything to do with um, beyond the authentication decision, which gets into the policy realm was outside the scope. And so I can tell you in that group, we didn't even have a common practice for topics like that, because they said it was out of scope. But what you described, Phil, to me is, you know, it's sort of in the scope from a state machine perspective, which is why I would construe it more as an errata. Aaron, I don't know if you have a voice since you're co-chair as well. Um, yeah, that's a Tough one. Um, do you have a sense of how of what the current state of deployments do? Like, is there a, a way to survey the deployments and see how many fall on which end of that decision was made? I I don't know to be honest. One of the things ITF doesn't do that people ask about is a certification suite. Mm -hmm. um, 
just from the experience of open ID, there are what the specs, there are always, I'm going to call them behaviors. They're always what the spec says, and then there are common patterns and behaviors. And the great thing that test suite does is it captures the behaviors. Um, so you can say, well, you're compliant, but you are doing something weird. And that tends to get exposed in compliance uh, mm -hmm. or in testing because the test suites would tend to sort of, in this case uh, that I said that in the test suite, uh, they would they would sort of say, oh, patch with uh, replace on a value that doesn't exist works. Okay, and the test suite accepts that. And then it sort of becomes an implied spec that, that the other. Uh, you know, what, what's been interesting is in both the TLS and the mask working group, not mask, sorry, quick. They had been holding and I believe that quick still does these interop tests um, more to ensure the maturity and the interoperability of implementations based on what's been authored in the specs. Mm -hmm. So if this group is interested in doing that, right? Um, we can hold sessions to that effect. Um, but again, it's all driven by, you know, the energy and, and the momentum that this group wants to follow. But what you're saying does make sense, Phil. Right. I'm a big fan of, of test suites as well. Um, the other thing it helps is it forces the spec, it kind of teases out those ambiguities in the spec. Because once you're creating the test suite, you realize that you end up sort of with these little holes that you then go back and plug, but. The, um, the other, the other ITF sort of official channel is the hackathon. So the, the goal of the hackathon. So for those who are not familiar, um, while we were doing it virtually, it, it was extended for the whole week before. The, the IETF sessions, um, now with the hybrid, I believe they start Friday. I'm not arriving till Saturday. Um, but anyway, um, the skim working group can sign up to have a table reserved and that's where. We can do, you know, plug fest interrupt testing. Um, call it what you like. Um, I can tell you in the TEEP working group, um, we started by just having a table and having the discussion of the realm of interoperability um, because in the first couple sessions, we didn't have implementation, um, but now we do. And, and um, they do, there are three, three vendors that um, continue, and again, the purpose is to ensure that um, the, the drafts are both implementable and that we can reach some level of interoperability. So I, I would absolutely encourage, you know, this group to at least participate in the hackathons. Um, that's not as demanding, sort of, um, in that they they meet, but there is a lot of prep work because you do have to do the coding. Um, but they do meet the weekend before ITF begins. Um, the other option is to follow. Um, I don't think it's officially through the ITF, but I mean TLS is so widespread. Um, that both the TLS working group and the quick working group have um, set up their own, you know, mechanisms for doing interoperability. Might be worth spending more time on the test suites because uh, um, I found a couple of test suites and there were a lot of issues with them, but uh, it's worth uh, uh, spending time saying what a test suite should test.
UK. My understanding, and Nancy, maybe you can clarify, is the ITF typically doesn't do test suites. Usually it's an independent org that picks it up like OpenID did for OAuth. Correct. Correct. And there was LDAP 2000, which was somebody else. I, I would say we encourage it, but it's, it's not in the yeah. scope of the IETF. That is correct. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, this helps with interoperability testing. Yep. If, if, if you work with the test suites and, and it's fine with the test suites, then interoperability gives you a higher confidence of, of it, things working uh, together. Okay, I'm going to need to cut off this discussion since we have a, a couple of other agenda items. Um, but these are all good topics. The testing is absolutely not in the IETF charter or in our groups charter. Um, but it is an activity that can be discussed. You know, off as we look to ensure that what we're. I look at it as a. Um, as a tool to ensure the um, validity of what we're drafting. Okay, um, let's keep moving on. Danny, if you wouldn't mind, I just want to make sure we have enough time um, to cover the housekeeping because I, I want to make sure Janelle has some time to talk about the GitHub that she helped set up. Um, so yeah, that just shouldn't take long. Yeah. Uh, just so just to close the loop on schema and protocol, uh, there hasn't really been any pen to paper at this point. It's all been just thinking about like strategy and of like what actions to take before taking them. Uh, I'm not too worried about how long it'll take to get us to get all the errata and clarifications processed. It's, I think it's a much smaller body of work than uh, say the work going on with use cases where it's you know pretty much a full rewrite. Um, and so moving on to the photos, uh, topic, uh, so something that, uh, I I've seen as, uh, in like the, the fast provisioning space that, um, is sort of highly desired, but also on the border of not being implementable is, uh, a skim client sending, uh, especially over the, over the internet. Uh, the uh, URI for a uh, profile picture for a user object. Um, the skim standard today says just include uh, a, a URL that points to where the picture is, and the uh, the skim server can then go back and read the picture from that. Uh, and there's no discussion in uh, the spec about how to handle uh, authorization or you know, authentication against that URL to secure the picture so that other parties cannot go and you know, traverse a list of all pictures in a directory, for instance. Uh, and so that's a topic that I would like to, at, you know, at, at some point figure out how to solve. Uh, I, it, it, like, I, I know that it's a problem. I need smarter brains and minds. So it's just, it's just, it's just sort of a, like a call for interest if anybody, you know, has interest in helping to solve that problem and write a draft on it, um, please. So are you, are you talking about a case where you post the URL for the picture and then the skim server behind the scene loads it or something? Or because normally the original spec was just that it's just a data field that you serve back and its authenticity is up to whoever administrated it in the first place before it goes in. So the skim server is just a data store in that regard. But solving the UI problem about whether it's a valid image and all the other stuff was up to yeah. The client that set it or the client that received it. One might be a web UI that receives it from the directory. Mm -hmm. um, the other one was an administrative UI that set it in the first place. So it sounds like within the protocol CIA, standpoint. I was just saying, it, it sounds like within the CIA triad, what Danny's talking about is the C, not so much the I. Is that right, Danny? Uh, I don't know what CIA is. So. Oh, comp confidentiality, integrity, and uh, authenticity. So uh, yeah, com confidentiality. Right. Okay. Yeah, and I would say the spec is agnostic to those issues right now. Well, the 
I guess what I'm trying to understand is whether the question is that the field should have confidentiality, but it doesn't today. So there's there's two things that we need to ensure that um, we're clean on as we update the protocol and the schema is that we are we are absolutely providing the security mechanisms as well as the privacy um, of the information that gets conveyed there. So uh, I'm not sure that all of it is in scope, Danny. So I'm still trying to understand the full extent of what you were well, describing. It's what you're talking about there, access control that describes what records you can see and what fields you can see. Because mm -hmm. that's not in the spec either. That's another. I can provide you... a proposal that, but. I, I, I don't know that you need to have that in the spec in order to encourage broad interoperability. It's not in the LDAP spec, for example. And yeah, we ran into a brick wall converting in LDAP from everybody's proprietary access controls to a standard one because the need for a standard wasn't clear. There might be here, um, but it's a big it's a big thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think part of the thing is is that it's this um, cross domain aspect of skim and crossing boundaries. You know, within an LDAP context, and you've got your LDAP server in your local data stores. That's one thing, but now we're trying to share this data between two different. You know, I'd also domains. comment that the, that the policy world is changing in a couple of dramatic ways. Well. Outside the ETF, ITF, but also in how people are handling it. So I'm working on two specs. Uh, one in the cloud native thing called open policy, which involves um, how you integrate and interconnect with policy systems. So it's open policy agent. And that's that's more about code and, and how you build things. And then there's another one that's more formal called identity query language that is coming out about generalizing policy in the cloud around identity. Um, and there's interplay possibilities with scale with skim with both, but they're taking a vastly different tack than we've all done before. Um, so I'm not sure uh, what I'm trying to say here is there's a lot happening. I'm not sure now is the right time for the skim work group to pick it up. I agree. I think there's a lot happening in that area and uh, we could get behind if we tried to do it just for skim. Okay, so maybe, Danny, maybe, I, I just want to make sure as much for the notes as my own edification. I'm understanding Danny's request, which which is if I'm a skim client, I'm saying, all right, go create these users. And, and oh, by the way, here are some photos for these users today. I have to pass a URL that is world readable, right? It has to be a URL that the skim server can go then fetch those pictures from. And, and Danny's point is, well, that's bad because anyone could discover those URLs and then go fetch all the photos for every employee in, in my organization. Which the, the skim. The skim server shouldn't be fetching photos. That's not the intent. We don't say that we do that. You, you, the skim server just serves up the URL that it was given. I see. And then it's so there's a, a the concept, concept of URL that controls access to the photo. That's the way I've interpreted it. Well, but the question yeah. is, does does the skim server know? So this gets to the confidentiality, right? Does the skim server, is that field in the clear, basically? Well, if the, it, is, any, is any information divulged within the string text of the URL? If the answer to that is no, then it's up to the server that's serving the, the photo to enforce authorization on right. and actually see the content of the URL. That's correct. But unless you serve, unless you explicitly store the photo, through the protocol directly as a binary, you're just storing a URL and retrieving a URL. The, the servers should not be fetching. It's not part of the protocol to, for the server to do something in the background that would be outside the spec. It can do that, but the spec is just 
storing okay. and retrieving. If I understood right. one of one guys, of I'm going to call time because there, there, I still want Janelle to cover the the housekeeping. Uh, I I think it does merit. So Danny, um, we can have you spend some time. Maybe well, I got to look at the agenda, which I want to spend more time on too. <laughs> um, I think, I think that's a great discussion, though. I don't want to interrupt it. <laughs> well, but, yeah. It, we only have 10 minutes left, right? Okay. Um, so sorry, I do have to we will, be the timekeeper here. We will pick that hot topic uh, up next so, time. So Danny, it does sound like it's a topic that we should continue. Um, I encourage you to bring it up in the Slack channel and then the mail group. Yeah, I'll do that. Um, and then if we have time and if you want to continue the discussion in the plenary in IETF 1, 113, let me know and I can add it to the agenda. Okay, Janelle. Great. Um, I've created yet another skim GitHub repo. I know that there was one previously. Um, and I'm just seeking agreement to adopt it and use it, not just have it be the submitted, accepted, adopted drafts, but be a working place that we can all work with. I can link it up maybe to the mailing list so that it can update the mailing list when people check things in. Um, and I've shared it with Nancy, Aaron, Danny, Pam, and Pam. <laughs> But I can yeah. I can share it with others. Is is that an okay thing for us to do, Nancy? Well, I, I think so. I so Aaron and I discussed it, and um, as long as we can have within the skim, and this is where my brain's not working this morning. Um, so in the skim GitHub project, if we can create two distinct sub projects. One project is the adopted documents. The other one is the work in progress. And that way your work in progress is where the folks who are still working on documents that haven't been adopted yet can use and track um, their work. But then once I'm expecting like the use cases and the base schema and protocol. Once those get adopted, then they move from that sub project from the work in progress to the adopted. Um, and so I, I couldn't remember Janelle if that's the way if you had created it as a project. I just created a repo called skim. And I can create multiple repos, or I could have one repo with multiple folders in the repo where we could move files from here to there, work in project or something. I, yeah, we could I have two separate, separate has... GitHub project projects. <laughs> I don't know if anybody has um, already done this in other groups, but what I've typically seen is a repo per draft. And uh, the nice thing about that is it keeps the issues uh, on a repo, and then the issues are associated with the particular draft. So, um, this may be only a problem in larger groups where there sometimes are drafts that people uh, are not interested in and only interested in some, and it lets you manage discussions better that way. Um, that's typically how I've seen it, seen it done, though. Yeah, so the, this uh, is. Also... Where... Oh, sorry, if I can just um, explain. So, this is where I get lost in, in the vocabulary, right? Because for the RATS working group, I've created an organization, which I think of as it's a GitHub, you go to GitHub, blah, 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 RATS. And then there, um, there is a separate repo for each of the drafts. Now, in all the other working groups, we've only, um, we only allow the adopted drafts in those organizations or, right. Um, but I haven't gone deeper right into which is why I was calling them a project or an organization and having sub ones underneath which I think is doable my apologies I cut someone oh, off yeah I think that that's a really good uh, suggestion Aaron and Nancy so 
this is such a new thing. There's not much going on because we've been treading very lightly. I'm a little bit scared to start doing things until we kind of came to an agreement. Um, I can create multiple repos for the different drafts. We'd like to do that. It's yeah, work in progress. So, Thanks, Janelle. Let me let me take a look at it again. Right. Okay. Um, okay. So the gating thing is, and again, typically we we um, only grant access to the authors for actual. Now I don't remember. I have to go back and look before I speak. Um, no, that sounds that sounds right. Only the authors get right access to it. Anybody is able to. You know, send a pull request to suggest changes, but only the editors can merge. Can commits. Yeah. And so that's think, where the administrators would, would manage that, yeah. which would be the chairs. I think Phil wanted to so, say something. So one of the things I want to be cautious of, because one of the things as a as an author is you're trying to trigger the group to read your content. So the only thing I'll be cautious of is the work in progress. You want to do it in a way that doesn't generate noise because then people stop reading anything. Um, and so I like the idea of if it's just holding the working group drafts and, and per project, so you can say I'm focusing on the uh, wh whatever the draft is and I want to post an issue for it. So I think that's going to work really well because it helps solve the problem that the mailing list has had. Um, the work in progress that sort of Maybe they're the authors are going to work in a branch that the general public isn't seeing. And the reason for that is that you're trying not to distract people with the noise. You want them to say, okay, I've published this, go read it now. Um, supported by the efforts of the chairs to, to, to remind people. Um, but I, I, I'm sort of conscious of noise. Uh, okay. You know, as so the not, authors so are going back and forth, you don't want to disturb everyone. So not every check-in gets sent to the mailing list. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good suggestion too. I would say anytime you publish it to the IETF document engine, it should be in the GitHub also published in the main master branch, whatever you call it. Um, and then you also publish to the IETF engine, so it's formally registered. Um, and then that's your trigger to let everybody know, okay, draft, Three is there, draft four is there, and so on. But as you, as the authors are revising that draft, the general work group probably isn't interested unless they choose to follow it in GitHub. I think that's a yeah, it's a great way of saying it, and that's again, I think the benefit of organizing it as a repo per draft, so that um, as a you know, as as someone who's on GitHub, you can choose to watch particular repos, and and you'll get notifications of of issues in only the ones that you're watching, and you can turn off notifications if you don't want to follow the details of a particular one. Um, the individual commits aren't really like pushed anywhere, and nobody sees those anyway, um, unless we hook up a a bot to report those to the mailing list, which I don't think is a good idea. Um, but it's mainly yeah. the issues that get the the sort of traffic and the and the discussion going and being able to filter those to choose which ones to tune into is is really helpful. Okay. Do I have any volunteers that want to help me structure this in our I'm I'm happy to help. Very yeah. team. I, okay. I can help Thank you, Janelle. I mean Aaron, Aaron and I will be the the ultimate administrators anyway. So yeah, I, you totally are. I you know I welcome your Guidance, but uh, at, at some sometimes it just feels like just the collaboration is impeding us at the moment. I think if we get that going, that we'll start cooking with gas. <laughs> okay, with that, I've got one minute left. So um, this is what I have as a tentative agenda, and Danny, depending on the times that we want to spend on the the bulk of of the work, meaning the use cases, protocol, and schema. If you want to add the, I'll call it confidential fields for now, you were referring it to it as the URI for photos, I can add that. But um, something for you, Janelle, and I'll, I'll ping Pam too, on how much time you think you'll need to cover each of them. We, uh, 
So given our last meeting, I only asked for one two hour session moving forward. You know, once we pick up momentum, we can ask for more time. Um, so currently we have two hours allocated. Um, we have about an hour and a half left um, for these. These meaning, sorry, for the main. And then, um, Danny, if you want me to add the other one, we can add that as well. Or you can bring it up in the context of um, the protocol and schema discussion. You can pull that in there too. Because yeah, to yeah, me, um, what, what you're discussing, okay. yeah. What you're discussing also goes to the security and the privacy considerations, um, the threat modeling, right? And privacy modeling for what we wanna standardize. Sorry, you were gonna say something. Um, yeah, just that um, I don't have a strong preference one way or the other of if we try to solve this, I guess, as part of so like the, the main protocol line, or if it, it just, you know, get, get a ragtag group of people together and write a draft to at least, you know, have a way to address the, the problem. So, however we, you know, I guess, uh, you know, structure it administratively of okay. uh, like where we're trying to put the solution. Right now, it's not feeling to me as a separate draft. As I mentioned, to me, it's feeling more like a security consideration and privacy. Um, and it could, and I'm misunderstanding the problem, right? But let's absolutely get that in the open. All right, so I can ping you guys um, in the next day or two, give you time to, to think about it, but I do need to post a rough agenda. Um, I think by the end of this week, if I'm not late already um, to the website. Okay, I apologize, I ran us one minute over time. Uh, thank you everyone for joining the call. We will see you in uh, Vienna, either virtually or in person. All right. Thanks everyone. Thank you.